All right, let's talk about drawing bandage diagrams in a systematic way and give you a recipe on how to do that pretty much for any structure that you uh, have um, in semiconductor devices, even advanced research devices. You will always want to start out from drawing a bandage diagram. We'll do this for a simple structure, but the recipe uh, given here will work also for complicated devices. All right, so. Let's draw a bandage diagram in equilibrium. Um, this is uh, in the previous calculations or uh, descriptions we have done. We always assumed that the uh, doping was constant in space, but now it becomes a function of space. And we'll do this here in one dimension. Of course, you can do this in multiple dimensions, and then you tend to do this on a computer. But even if you had a three-dimensional device, you will always end up wanting to plot these bandage diagrams probably as line plots cut through a multidimensional space. All right, so we start from here. In equilibrium, where there's no current flow, we will um, start from detailed balance. And in, if that's the case, sorry, we will always draw a flat Fermi level. Um, when we go into non-equilibrium, uh, where they are in DC, like we are applying a constant voltage and looking at the current, or when we have uh, time dependence or small signal, etc., we will uh, do perform solutions to the problem in a later section. Uh, here, we're just going to look at equilibrium. All right, so let's uh, have a shortcut to the band diagram. Uh, we know we have space charge, ND and NA, next to the junc junction. We will draw a Fermi level throughout the device. Okay, this Fermi level will be flat. We start from there, okay? And um, there will be a conduction and a valence band in the structure that we can uh, draw on the far, far edges. So, we'll draw Number, step number one, we start with EF. And then we'll uh, determine what the distance here is between the Fermi level on the uh, uh, bulk side on N here. So that's the conduction band here. And we do the same for the valence band. Okay, in uh, the conduction band and the valence band on the P side. Now, I had mentioned in the previous segment that there is the vacuum level determined by chi 1. So here is now chi 1, which is basically the energy difference for an electron to, to leave the semiconductor completely. Similar, we do this for the uh, vacuum level here on the P side. Okay, we just draw it in. And now what we do is we, we join the vacuum levels by a constant line, by some shape like this, a smooth, a smooth shape. And um, then we uh, forget about this junction a little bit here in this form, and we transfer down the, the curved shape from the uh, vacuum uh, level down into the conduction band. We just take these shapes and connect that to the conduction band edge and the valence band edge on the N side and do the same on the P side. Okay, so we transfer it down. Now, you might end up with a diagram where you have this strange looking triangular uh, shaped uh, band edges. Well, that is coming from the fact when chi 1 and chi 2 are not the same. That means on the left and the right of the p-n junction, you might have material that is different from each other, where the excitation from a conduction band to the vacuum is different. And that will translate itself into the junction. All right, now we're going to apply a boundary condition at infinity. We need to know in more detail uh, the distance uh, between the conduction band here to the Fermi level and here. We have, we call these energetic differences delta 1 
on the left and delta 2 on the right. Okay, what this means is within this built-in potential, you can imagine an electron leaving the device on the left completely, leaving the semiconductor completely. You take it out, you don't give it more energy, uh, and then you can have it re-enter on the, say, on the P side, and it can close the loop at a constant energy. That means you are conserving energy uh, in through this built-in potential, and um, uh, the, uh, the accounting for chi 1, chi 2, and the difference between the Fermi level. So, this is always true. This loop in energy from delta 1 plus chi 1 plus some built-in potential equals the energy of chi 2, uh, the gap, and then delta 2. So this built-in potential balances out uh, the, the energy, um, uh, complete closed loop energy in the system. So again, the point is you need to find a way to put uh, an energy scale that is true for the left and the right uh, side of the semiconductor in perfect equilibrium. Okay. Now, you can determine delta 1 and delta 2 uh, via doping concentrations, okay? So, we have expressions for that. Chi 1 and chi 2 are material parameters, and the built-in potential is the unknown that we need to find. Okay, the built-in potential is the difference between the gap and delta 2, delta 1, chi, one uh, chi 2, and chi 1. I mean, you just solve this expression from the top. We have expressions already for delta 2, that is a function for uh, the, the donor doping here. We have an expression for delta 1 here for the uh, donor doping, and chi 2 minus chi 1 are material properties that you can look up it for standard semiconductor materials. So that means we have an expression for the built-in potential in any standard PN junction for any standard materials that we know how to join, um, matching crystals, etc., are of course uh, a concern in any of this. All right, so let's look at the interface boundary condition here. So we had uh, a uh, displacement function here for, uh, as indicated here, for a homo, a homo junction. And it could be uh, the electric field for a heterojunction may actually be different. What needs to be continuous in a junction is the um, displacement field, which includes the dielectric function um, in it. So there's a continuity of the displacement uh, field, not necessarily of the electric field. The electric field will vary if there is um, a, a difference in dielectric constant, which typically would be the case if you have a heterostructure at the at the interface. Okay, so these two are related by the ratio of the dielectric constants of the two materials. Again, at the interface, what needs to be continuous is the uh, uh, dialect, uh, the displacement field. Now let's look at the built-in voltage for a homo junction to make it a little bit easier and build this up again. Again, the starting drawing recipe is draw the Fermi level uh, on uh, throughout the whole device. Then determine um, the uh, distance of the conduction band on the N side from the Fermi level, draw in the valence band. Again, on the N side, the Fermi level will be closer uh, to the conduction band. You do the same for the P side. Oh, I forgot to say, draw in the chi 1. And do the same thing on the P side. And connect the, uh, the two uh, uh, vacuum levels. And displace the connectors uh, Rigorous, uh, rigorously below, like this. And if the materials have the same vacuum level, then you don't have this step-like uh, 
difference in the electrostatic potential like it. Okay, so you have a smooth potential if the vacuum levels are the same in the material and you get the built-in potential just like you did before, but the difference between chi 1 and chi 2 falls away. All right, so here we are. The built-in potential has the same expression. These two guys cancel out and you basically can plug in numbers uh, given that if you know the material, like the density of states, effective uh, 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 densities of states, conduction band and valence band density of states, here are the dopings, you know the gap, you know the temperature, you can basically figure out what the built-in potential uh, would be. All right, so let's look at an anal uh, the analytical solution of Poisson equation again. So here we have, again, the depletion region approximation as we had it. And now we're writing down Poisson uh, uh, equations like this. And we're assuming a homogeneous material with one, uh, uh, one specific uh, dielectric constant. And let's carry this through. So we have this charge. We integrate the charge to get an electric field. From the electric field, we get the electrostatic potential. Um, and here are the expressions that we have. So, you have an electric field on the left and the right side of the junction that needs to be continuous. And that means that Nd times Xn equals Na times Xp. What does that mean? It means there's charge neutrality. These two charge blocks, in a sense, need to add up to, uh, to the identical amount. Of course, that makes sense, right? Because basically, the free charges are adjusting themselves such that um, they uh, balance the electric field with the diffusion uh, current. All right, so given that, we can now uh, plug these expressions back for the electric field on the left and the right of the junction and have a built-in electric field, a uh, built-in potential like this. Okay, so uh, nothing much happened where we just have linear expressions like this for the electric field. We have charges, we integrate those charges and have uh, linear dependence, uh, linear uh, electric field dependencies and get to a, a built-in potential that is now a function of the square of each of these blocks. All right, not a whole lot has happened. We can solve this for xn and xp. And we see that the built-in potential shows up in the, square, in the square root here. The dielectric constant shows up here as well. And you could do the same thing for a uh, heterojunction where chi1 and chi2 are different. So we, I'll leave that for an exercise for you. So with that, we really have a general recipe with a complete analytical solution. We have a depletion region approximation where uh, these charge blocks need to be identical. We can integrate these charge blocks for an electric field. We'll get a um, an electrostatic potential with a, ultimately a built-in uh, field. If you needed to have an ex explicit expression for the electric field inside of the junction, you can calculate it at specific points. You know that uh, the, uh, you can t the derivative here of the uh, electric field is constant. You can integrate that up. And so you basically have inside this region here, you can have a sliver of charge like this. You can integrate it and integrate it up from, say, zero to some uh, electric field. That will give you a charge over uh, a region in space. And it, you basically have a linearly dependent electric field, just like what we had sketched before. Now you can do the same for the whole charge on the right. These are switched here. And um, 
again, I'm just going back to just say these electric fields are linear functions of x. Okay? What uh, baffled me for a second here is that these two N, D, N, and A are flipped from left and right. I'm sorry. Okay, so learning how to draw these band diagrams is probably the most important thing that you do in this course. Whenever you study a new device to understand what is as to where charges may or may not flow, where they might be located at interfaces, etc., or at heterojunctions. If you follow these rules here, you will be able to draw these bandage diagrams for any of the standard devices, any advanced devices, and most researchers will sit down and will say, show me what your bandage diagram looks like. And if a person can't draw the bandage diagrams, you start to worry about it, whether they truly understand their device. So that's a key message to take away. And um, with that, I'll conclude section 19. Thank you very much.